start with a, and my clicker's dead. <laughs> Seriously. All right, we're going to do this manual mode. Uh, I want to start by talking about presenting problems. So a presenting problem is a medical term, and it refers to when you go to the doctor and you say something like, my arm is sore, that's your presenting problem. All you really know at that point is that your arm is sore, and you're hoping that the doctor can tell you what's going on. So the way it's defined is the initial symptom motivating the patient to consult the practitioner. I'm actually out of breath. That was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> so on your software project, there are a number of presenting problems that you might run into that are indicative of low code quality. The most common is slow progress. So it might feel like you're fighting against your editor and against your code every time you want to make a change. Another is bugs. It might feel that when you make a change, expecting like you know what's going to happen to the code base, that something over in a different place starts to malfunction. It's hard to predict the change that your, uh, your code modification is going to have on the entire system. And in the worst case, you can end up in this game of whack-a-mole, where you fix one bug and three more bugs are created. And you feel like you're constantly fighting against your code base to get everything stable so that you can ship it to production. And this creates a vicious cycle. Usually, it starts with pressure. For whatever reason, the company has something that needs to be done by a certain period of time. Maybe a customer is demanding a feature before a certain date, or you're trying to get something done before a conference, and the developers are on the receiving end of that pressure. The problem is that developers write the worst code when they are under pressure, and this can be considered slop. Now, slop can help you on a very short uh, amount of time if you're trying to get something done and the quality of it doesn't matter for just like maybe a few days. But over time, sloppy code causes you to be late. Eventually, you won't be able to deliver software for the organization on a timely basis. And that lateness causes additional pressure. So this is a vicious cycle. And some of you may have felt this on projects that you've been on or even the projects you're on right now. I know I have. So what's going on? Why does code quality have this vicious cycle? Generally, there's a lot of opposing forces to producing good quality code. The business is changing out from under you. Lots of us work for startups who are still trying to figure out how we're going to make money off what we're doing. There's technology changes. Sometimes we need to modify our software to support like a new database, uh, support more scalable architecture, and that can have ripple effects through your code base. And thirdly, there are team changes. So maybe you have to have somebody roll off a project onto a different team or even to a different organization, or maybe your team's growing and you're adding people, but not everybody that you're adding has the same level of experience as the developers who started the project. And they certainly don't have the same level of knowledge about why all the decisions that were made in the coding the application were made that way. So this leads to a bit of a problem. Uh, David Peterson made this diagram I really like. And it goes, uh, it explains at the code level why software quality issues start to appear. Uh, it, sa it starts with developers not wanting to introduce bugs, but realizing that it's easy to introduce a bug when you change the code. I think we all know this instinctively, even if not consciously. So you think about that, and you say, well, I know that I can minimize the change to the existing code if I copy and paste the code, because then I'm not changing the existing code. And this leads to duplication. Additionally, sometimes you can carve a code path around something with conditional logic. So you know you're not changing the existing code path, you're just adding a new one just for this one thing. But over time, this creates complexity. Duplication and conditional logic creates complexity in object-oriented systems. And it means that it's hard to understand the ramifications of a change you're about to make, feeding back into the beginning of the system. This is probably going on in your project, even if you don't actually realize these steps are taking place. And over and over again, that's why uh, maintenance problems will start to build up. OK, so all that leads to legacy code. Now, there's a lot of definitions of legacy code, but I'm going to give you my formal definition of legacy code. Legacy code is a noun, and it means code that was written by someone else, or, co <laughs> or code that was written by you more than two weeks ago. That's legacy code. So how do you avoid this? Uh, Einstein used to say, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And I feel like that's what a lot of software projects are doing. Everyone's been on that project that was horrible to work on. It was a brownfield project. It was really slow and terrible, and there were bugs. And everyone just wanted to move to the greenfield project, right? Have you been there? The problem with that is when you get to the green field, the question is, well, what is going to be done differently to make sure that that project, given a couple years, doesn't end up like the previous project? And that's where a lot of teams fall down, is trying to figure out the answer to that question. Uh, so my uh, hypothesis is that hope is not a plan. You have to actually do something tangibly different than the previous project to make the next project turn out better. And we'll look at how. So I would start with gathering data. Every project has different aspects, even if the resulting problem is the same, which is code quality and the downstream effects of that. You can gather data in lots of ways. 
uh, retrospectives, one-on-ones between managers and their direct reports. Uh, you can collect process metrics like lead time, cycle time, velocity, try to figure out what's going on. You can survey your team. This is a really underused, simple tactic that I like. Uh, have you ever had a project that everyone felt like was going to be late, but no, everyone was afraid to say anything about it? Try doing an anonymous survey of everybody on the project. One to five, how confident are you that we're going to hit our release date? And then collect those and base a discussion around the data you get back. And you can also use software metrics. So this is near and dear to my heart. I started a company around software metrics. Uh, but there's a lot of ways you can get information out of a code base just by analyzing the code that's in there. This is Code Climate, which does some of that. But in Ruby, we have a lot of open source tools that can tell you things like where the duplication and the complexity issues are in your code base, or what are your classes that you're having to go back to and change all the time every time you introduce a new feature. So when you're ready to start taking steps to improve your quality, there's two primary things you need to do. You need to stop. Uh, first, you need to do no harm. So don't introduce any new problematic code. This is the most important thing, because if a lot of teams know they have a quality problem, but they continue to introduce new quality, problem, uh, new quality issues as they're going, and that's just making their problem worse. So when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Second is the Boy Scout rule. With the Boy Scout rule means always leave your campsite in better condition than you found it. And when you apply this to code, it means every time you're making a change to your code base, improve something. It can be simple, it can be small, it can be cleaning up the style of a block of code, extracting one piece of logic. And if you do this over time, your quality can only go up, right? Because you haven't created any new problems, and you're working at the existing problems bit by bit. The problem is lots of teams kind of have that idea in mind, and it still doesn't happen in practice. So the rest of the talk, we're going to look at why. One of the problems that you might find is that your team doesn't have enough refactoring experience. If you go back to that scenario where you have a new developer joining the team, that developer might not be as confident that they can do the perform refactorings as your senior developers on your team. They might not know exactly what the best way to refactor it is, so they elect to do nothing. This is something that you can work on actively as a team. Uh, something super simple, you can do lunch and learn sessions. We're in a world where you can get tons of really valuable content for free over the internet from conferences, confreaks, uh, there are blog posts and lots of software engineering books, which are good fodder for this. Sit down around a pizza and talk about uh, a talk or a blog post or a chapter in a book and how it applies to the problems that your team is facing. And what you can do is you can rotate the person who's actually picking out the material you're going to review so everybody's taking an active process in leveling your team up. Team factoring. Uh, sometimes this has been called mob programming. What I mean by this is get everybody into a room for an hour Pick out one piece of code that you know is bad. Let's say the, like the user RB class is a common problem in Rails apps. And just spend an hour trying to clean it up as a group. Now, the value in this is not the code that's going to come out of it. The value is in the discussions that are had during the process. So a senior developer might say, hey, we've seen this problem before. Here are the three ways we've tried to solve it, and here's what we learned in each. Or a junior developer might ask, I've noticed that this is the way that this is being done. What's the reasoning behind this? That's all the value. When you get to the end, just you probably just want to toss out the code that you did during the refactoring session, because it probably doesn't pass the test. It's probably not production ready, unless your team is really good and can do that in an hour. Uh, but that's not the point. It's the communication value. So another problem you might have is finding problems too late. Have you ever had that situation where you're like really trying to keep up the quality of something, and you open up a file, maybe a class that was being worked on recently, and it's just not up to spec? Like It's not in good shape. And you're like, when was this made? You know, and you're hoping that it's going to be like two years ago. And you look in the Git log, it's like, oh, that was coded last week. Shit, now what do I do? Right? And your options aren't very good. Your options are kind of like, well, I can leave it, or I can stop everything I'm working on and go back and refactor this code that may never have needed to change again anyway. So what's the value of that refactoring? So this is why I like to say that broken code gets fixed, crappy code lasts forever. Uh, so you don't want to end up in that situation. What you'd rather have happen is as soon as the crappy code gets written, your team responds to that by improving it in the normal course of business without having to interrupt their flow. And there's some ways that you can do that. You probably have some early warning systems already in place on your project. And this is my favorite way to deal with this, is early warning systems. Uh, you probably get emails when your build fails, right? That's a simple example. It means that a system detected that the code that you've written is not up to the ex executable specifications that you've defined for how that code needs to behave. And you alert your team for that, and hopefully you respond to that right away. But you can actually go much further than that. Uh, there are tools that, with an automated system, can detect likely bugs and quality issues in your code base. So if you check in a debugger statement, that's something that's trivial to detect in a code base. If you put an assignment in a conditional, 
that was probably supposed to be a comparison, that can get flagged for further review. Or if you copy and paste a bunch of code, that can be detected, and maybe, you know, I do this all the time. I copy and paste code, and then I intend to go clean it up later, but sometimes the phone rings, and I get distracted and pulled off, and it gets committed and ends up in master. This gives you a way to detect that and find a way out. And even more advanced issues, like security issues, which can be pretty severe, a lot of those can be detected using automated systems. So this is an example of a team getting chat notifications that they introduced some p potential security vulnerabilities in their Rails applications. This is from Code Climate, but this is the kind of thing that you can set up yourself using tools on your CI system and the plethora of open source Ruby tools that can do static analysis for things like complexity, duplication. Uh, in Ruby, there's a tool called Breakman, which does the security analysis. You can wire this sort of th stuff together yourself and send out an email when something needs to be reviewed right away. Okay, so there was some talk about code reviews in the, in, during the lightning talks, and it's kind of stealing my thunder a little bit. Uh, but this is how I think Ruby developers think about code reviews. It's a little hard to read, but the XKCD says, the only valid measurement of code quality is WTFs per minute. And then <laughs> on the left side, you've got a, a code review that's going well, and there's only a couple WTFs. And then on the, the right side, you've got a code review that's going poorly, uh, and everyone's just cursing up a storm. And I feel like this is what most Ruby developers expect when they hear the word code review. Uh, and it sounds like a totally unpleasant situation for both the reviewer and the person whose code is being reviewed. Who wants to be behind that door in that room at that time? Like, nobody, right? Um, however, fortunately, uh, we've already kind of been tricked a little bit. Uh, formal code review sounds like something that's awful and terrible, but something that sounds really great is GitHub pull requests. Uh, and they're kind of just the same thing. Uh, I, I get in trouble for saying that, but they have similar outcomes. You can accomplish similar things with GitHub pull requests that you do with a, a code review. It is a code review, right? You're reviewing the branch before you merge it. So I advocate a lot for teams that are struggling with code quality issues to take a step back and introduce uh, a, a review process, probably based on pull requests, and spend a little bit more time looking at code before you consider it to be done, before you move on to the next thing. So code reviews don't have to be painful. In fact, they can be rather painless. Uh, you can make them non-blocking. You can make them asynchronous, so the reviewer doesn't have to be doing the review at the same time the reviewee is sitting right next to them. Uh, although, in cases where things can be a bit more complex, that's a good escalation, a next step. If you have questions, then sit next to somebody. Uh, and they can be opt-in. Just because you're doing code reviews doesn't mean that you need to open a pull request for changing copy on your terms of service page. Uh, you, can have, you can trust your development team to judge whether a change to the code base requires a review, and if not, just push it to master, and if it does require a review, then have them open a pull request. And then the amount of code reviews that are taking place is, becomes a variable in your process that you can tweak. You can talk at your retrospective and say, hey, it felt like you know, a lot of code was getting shipped that I really wish we had another set of eyes on, and then do more reviews, or the opposite. Like, hey, it feels like we're not really actually having much feedback when we do the reviews, so maybe we should do fewer reviews, you can, and you can adjust. Uh, and the reason you do code reviews is you can't edit your own writing. So I actually do uh, some writing for blog posts. I, I also edit people's blog posts from time to time, and they're very different experiences. Uh, it's not really possible once you've participated in the authorship experience of a work, whether that's uh, prose or code, to actually take a step out of that and evaluate it from a blank slate, right? Like, this is why in, in, uh, instinctively we have other people read our stuff and like, uh, review it and give us feedback on it. And I think it's very much true of code. If you are involved in the sort of painful process of working out the solution to this problem, you've got all this context in your head about how you ended up in the solution. But on an ongoing basis, all that really matters is that your solution works, and also it matters a lot that people can look at this code and understand it. And that's what you can get from an editorial process. So when you're reviewing code, there's a number of things that you can look for. Uh, you can look at formatting. Does it match our style guide? I recommend that most teams have a, a style guide that everyone's following. Is it correct? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Now, this is stuff that should normally be handled in the authorship process. Somebody shouldn't be asking for review which is not formatted correctly and doesn't work. Like, that's not a very good use of time. Um, but then you get into scalability. Is this code going to be performant? That should also generally be ha uh, happening during the authorship process. But sometimes the reviewer can say, hey, actually, this is a really hot code path. I don't know if you know, but we do this in, like, three nested loops. So we need to make sure this doesn't have any negative performance implications. You can have those conversations. Uh, security is a really big one. Most security bugs get found by somebody taking another look at something, or an extra set of eyes looking at something and saying, ah, eh, this doesn't seem quite right. I'm not sure what the issue here is, but this seems a little risky. Uh, and then you can find security issues before they get shipped. Uh, and the big one is comprehension. So is this understandable? 
do the names make sense, right? There's no computer program that's going to be able to tell you whether the names are right or not. It's kind of dependent on you and your team. It doesn't make sense within your context. That's the number one thing I would be looking for in a code review process, and tends to be one of the number one problems with code maintainability over time, is really the right abstractions are not in place. Something might be over abstracted, it might be under abstracted, or it might be extracted at the right level, but the names are just not clear to someone who wasn't involved in the authorship. And that's the kind of stuff you can find easily during a code review process. Okay. So if you're going to go back to your work next week and you're going to say, we, guys, we know we have code uh, quality problems. What are we going to do about it? Here's what I would suggest. Start by gathering data. Figure out what's going on on your specific team in terms of why code quality issues are, are being introduced. It's a very different thing to go into a team which maybe has all senior software engineers who are very comfortable refactoring but just aren't refactoring for one reason or another versus a team which has maybe a mixed level of experience and people just don't actually know how to do the refactoring and that's why it's not getting done. So you want to diagnose what's going on inside of your team and inside of your code base. Where are the problem spots? What are the areas that we keep struggling with? Sharpen the saw. So do whatever you need to do to level up your team's abilities and understanding to be able to address the problems that are facing you using the techniques that we looked at earlier. First, do no harm. You have to stop introducing poor quality code into a code base that has maintainability problems. Otherwise, you, are, you have no chance of digging out of that hole. Uh, and that's the biggest piece is just make sure that there's no more issues being introduced. Pull requests can help you with that. And then follow the Boy Scout rule. Make sure that every change you're making to the code base uh, is improving the quality of the code bit by bit, even if it's small. If you put those things together, you're going to be in much better shape. And what you can do is you can replace that vicious cycle with a virtuous cycle. So quality leads developers to be more satisfied. And satisfied developers are more engaged in their work. Now we all know when we're more engaged in our work, then we take more responsibility for the work that we're doing, and responsible developers produce higher quality code. So you can replace the vicious circle we saw at the beginning with a virtuous cycle where quality is self-reinforcing and perpetuating itself throughout your organization and your code base. And if you do this over time, you'll find that you're able to deliver features much quicker than you were before, You'll find that the bugs are going away, and it's easier to anticipate what impact a change you're about to make to the code base will have. And both your developers and the rest of your organization will be much happier because you have a sustainable approach to code quality that's going to let the business uh, deliver on what it needs to deliver in order to be successful. Thank you very much.